something good is about to happen in your life. I believe that by the precious Holy Spirit. I believe that God's doing a work in your life, even as we've been worshiping and as you got to hear from Pam. I just really believe that God wants to touch your life in a special way today. I really believe that. Psalm 118 says that this is the day that the Lord has made. We're going to rejoice and be glad in it. Isn't that good news? We can rejoice and be glad no matter what is going on in this season in your life, no matter what trial, this is the day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad. And so help us, Holy Spirit. We welcome you, Lord, right here, right there. Holy Spirit, you're everywhere. You're like touching our lives as we magnify your work, as we magnify your help that Jesus commissioned you to, to bring into our life. We believe we receive right now the goodness of God in our lives in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Oh, we're going to be... Going on to part two of There's a Fire. Now, let me just give you a quick review because this is so exciting, but we're building on some principles, some very strong foundations about the fire of God, the baptism that Jesus brings into our life. Isn't that right? Matthew 3, verse 11, Jesus is the baptizer who baptizes us with Holy Spirit and fire. And here's what we're learning. In review, here's what we're learning. The baptism of Holy Spirit and fire will bring into our life illumination, but then elimination, which we're going to talk more about today. Fire kills off the toxins and the bacteria, scares the wolves and the lions, and it melts your enemies. But then number three, it produces amalgamate amalgamation. Isn't that a good thing? It brings cohesion, unity, fusion. It makes weak elements strong and non-corrosive. That's a good thing. It brings detonation. Fire ignites it dreams. It, it ignites your dreams. It, it brings creative combustion. It puts your satellites in orbit. Detonation. Number five, it brings agitation. It excites, stirs up, generates. It bakes the bread. I mean, it invents things. It causes confusion in your enemy. So agitation is a good thing when it's working for you. And number six, celebration. It lifts you up. It promotes you. It creates an atmosphere. It draws others in, the good people in, and it scares the wolves off. Celebration. It's a good thing. We actually got to see, didn't we? Look, a little review I think is going to be playing right now, but we actually got to see an analogy or a natural representation of what our existence looks like without Jesus in our heart, empty, just a wire frame. But with Christ in our heart, we become heirs of all of God's promises, including the ultimate, which is the baptism of Jesus, which we know from Matthew 3.11, Jesus baptizes us with the Holy Spirit. And look at that, fire. Fire's produced. We learn that... That is a good thing, not a bad thing, not an evil thing. It's so good that it fuels your design. Oh, Holy Spirit confirms your identity as a child of God, as a child of light, a child of love, and as an inheritor of Father God. Let's take a look again at Romans 8, verse 15. I ended off part one with this verse because it's so exciting. For as many as are led by the Holy Spirit of God, these are the sons and daughters of God. For you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear. Well, that's good news. But we receive the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. You see, the fire of God actually fuses us and melts us into God's family. So in part one, we really zoned in on the illumination power of Jesus' baptismal fire. We had fun with looking at the natural trinity of air plus fuel plus heat equaling fire, right? That was our ultra simple analogy, ultra simple analogy of God's breath, Jesus, the substance, the word, and the precious Holy Spirit being the movement and the heat. It equals fire. My dear friend, don't lose hope. Don't you lose hope. There's a fire. Don't you give up. There's a fire. God's got fire for you to save your life. Remember this. Jesus said in John 16, verse 7. I'm just going to sum it up. And he just said, it's profitable for you, advantageous for you. Who was he talking about? Precious Holy Spirit. The baptism of the Holy Spirit. 
It's profitable for you, he said. His disciples were sad. He told these sad, depressed disciples, guys, it's so good for you that I go because then I'll be able to send the comforter. You see, then when Jesus died on the cross and was broken and was pierced, then he had access not just to be with us, but to be in us. And when he could be in us, then he could welcome the baptism of the precious Holy Spirit and not until. So you get these sad, depressed disciples standing right beside Jesus. Jesus wants to baptize us with the Holy Spirit and fire. Think about this. The disciples had Jesus, they, they were, but yet they were so fearful. They were doubtful. Even Judas basically abandoned the faith with Jesus in the room. He betrayed God with Jesus in his life. How does that happen? How does that? See, we need to ask, how in the world could that happen? How could Peter betray Jesus with Jesus in the room? No fire. How do you doubt Jesus when Jesus is standing right beside you? No fire. No heat. No movement. No activation of the Word. See, the Word, it's good to get it in your heart, but it must be activated. Even Jesus said, man can't live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds. Something's got to move the Word. Well, that's the ministry of the precious Holy Spirit. The other 11 disciples, remember, they dearly loved Jesus and they wanted to do right. They so desperately wanted to do right. Peter even said, I'm going to lay my life down for you, Jesus. But without the movement of the Holy Spirit on the word that he had given them, there was no fire in their life to stand. So what? So they ran. They all deserted Jesus in his hour of need. They scattered like fearful little bunnies. No, not one lion among them. Why? Only God's fire awakens the lion of the tribe of Judah on the inside of you. Oh, ho, ho. so get ready. I want you to get ready right now because I told you that fire illuminates. But now in part two, I want you to see the good side of how fire eliminates. See, that's right. There's a fire. The fire of God that eliminates, destroys and casts down. You're like, oh, well, I see, I knew we were going to get to the part where fire is kind of consuming and dangerous. Oh, some of you, you're already being tempted to think religious on me now. Oh, that sounds ter terrible, Pastor Stephen. The elimination fire consumes, ah, scary. But is it really scary? Is it really? If you were out in the ocean swimming and a white shark about 15 feet long started circling you, would you want the problem just illuminated or would you want it eliminated also? I'm going to be honest with you. I want that shark gone, eliminated. If the doctor said you had a disease in your body and she had no solution for you, would you think it terrible for that disease to be completely eliminated, destroyed, and brought to nothing? I think you'd be pretty excited. If you had a thief trying to steal your family's money, your identity, your home, your safety, would you be interested in the fire of God that fights against your enemies? I think you would. I really do. I think you would. And if a lie or an accusation is trying to destroy your name, your reputation, wouldn't you want the fire of God to destroy and consume that lie? To destroy the demonic strategies of coercion and extortion waged against you? I think you would. I think it would be comforting to you to know that God's fire is working on your behalf, producing elimination. And if you don't, if you're sitting there, no, say, no, I wouldn't want God to interfere with something like that. Well, my friend, you really do need Jesus to illuminate some self-worth in your life. 1 John 3, verse 8. For this reason, the Son of God was manifest, to destroy the works of the devil. I got to read it again. For this reason... The Son of God, Jesus, was manifest to destroy the works of the devil. You've heard me say this before, but Jesus came. The Word came to destroy the destroyer. Can you just think about that? Jesus is the destroyer of the destroyer. That's a good thing. Praise God. That's great news. But how does Jesus do that? Well, with His holy fire. The enemy, the devil, he is, uh, he's fire intolerant. Imagine that. He promotes tolerance of all evil, but he can't tolerate fire. Hmm, maybe that's why he needs you to be afraid of the baptism 
of the Holy Spirit and fire. Did you ever think about that? Maybe that's why he wants you to be religious about the thought of Holy Spirit and fire because he's okay with the steel wool being over here. He's okay with Jesus being in your heart as long as Jesus in your heart is never activated by the movement of the precious Holy Spirit. It's Jesus who said, man can't live by bread alone, but by every word. Remember, John 1 says, in the beginning was the word, the word was with God, and the word was God. Jesus is the word. Jesus said, man can't live by bread alone, but by every word that moves, that proceeds from the mouth of God. There has to be movement for there to be fire. Psalm 68, verses 1 and 2. Check this out. Let God arise and his enemies be scattered. Let those who hate God flee before him. As smoke is driven away, so drive them away, the enemies. As wax melts before the fire, so let the wicked and the guilty perish before the presence of God. Can you see that? That God's presence is a fire. Now, God welcomes you and me as children of the Most High God into his presence. That's where we want to abide I mean, Psalm 91 says that it's our hiding place. It's a secret place for us to live, to abide. We were designed for God's fire, for God's light, for God's love. But the enemies hate God's fire. God is not willing that any should perish. I want you to remember that. No one. Nobody. You have to choose to be on the losing team. Did you know that? John 3, verse 17, it's not quoted as much as verse 16, but listen to this. For God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world. See, Jesus didn't come to condemn the world, but that the world through Jesus might be saved. He's the Savior. And as we've already established, 1 John 4, verse 8 says that God is love. C.S. Lewis, the famous author, he, you know, he wrote Chronicles of Narnia, he was once a self-proclaimed atheist, and he hated, loathed God. But then the fire of God consumed both his hatred with love and his doubts in the intense fire of genuine faith. And he became an amazing born-again Christian and activated by the Holy Spirit to produce so many great works that inspired millions upon millions, and still to this day, with the truth. You see, faith does truly move mountains, even if it has to melt them in the process. Let me remind you again of what we just read. Psalm 68, just verse 2. Listen to this. As wax melts before the fire, so let the wicked and the guilty perish before the presence of God. You know what I see when I read that? I see the wickedness of the wicked melting out of their heart. I see the guilt and shame of the guilty evaporating and them coming to Jesus. That's what I see. Fire consumes what is dead. We've been taught to be afraid of God's mystery, to be afraid of God's fire, that somehow it's destructive fire to us. But the truth is God speaks to us from a place of life, not death, from a, a place of light, not darkness, from a place that's holy ground where you can remove your shoes and God even protects the lowest, most vulnerable part of your life. What kind of loving God would not deal with the sharks in your life, with the wolves and the vipers and the bears and the predators of your soul? What kind of loving God would that be? Is God the consuming fire a good or a bad thing? Well, think about this. Is denature good or bad? I ask this because when strong fire touches something, it changes its natural structure. You see, the word denature means to change the nature of something permanently. That's what Jesus came to do for me. Isn't that what he came to do for you? And there's nothing like his fire to accomplish that denature, that change. Let's face it. The only time we don't like fire is when it's out of context, when the log rolls out of the fireplace, so to speak. But God is a context expert. And I want you to think about this. When God had a meeting in the desert with Moses, let's take a look at that. Exodus chapter 3, verse 2. Then the angel of the Lord appeared to him, to Moses, in a blazing fire from the midst of a bush. And he looked, and behold, the bush was burning with fire, yet the bush was not being consumed. You see, the unusual thing for Moses here is not that the bush is burning. That was kind of typical in the desert. We're talking about you got lots of air, 
you got lots of fuel, and you, you have a ton of heat, right? So, I mean, a, a bush breaking out in fire wasn't an unusual sight. But here's what was unusual for Moses living in the desert. The supernatural thing that caught his eye was that the bush was burning but was not consumed. It wasn't burned up. The leaves weren't damaged. The little twigs weren't charred. Fire, energy, light, but no damage. No burning of the little twigs and the beautiful little leaves. Let me bring you back to Hebrews 12, 29. This is a quote from Deuteronomy 4, verse 24. For our God is indeed a consuming fire. So what's going on here? You see, the great mighty God who gives the sun its power to burn, and yet is so gentle that even when He manifests as Jehovah in a burning fire out of this bush, He doesn't even char a gentle little leaf or scorch the tiniest little new branch. Oh, can you see this? Oh, it's beautiful. You see, when a religious mindset hears consuming fire, they come up with these driving sentiments that have fueled Christianity service for far too long, like, you got to burn out for Jesus. I don't know why I put a southern accent on that, but for some reason it sounds like, you got to burn out for Jesus. That is an ignorant and a foolish thing to say. Paul wrote to the Galatians on the same subject, saying to them, they were foolish to be centered on their own sacrifice and trying to actually compare it to Jesus' sacrifice and His finished work on the cross. Plus, we've established that God is love. He's life. So the essence of His burning or His consuming fire is intense love and life. That's the outcome of it. That's the ROI. You know what ROI is, right? Return on investment. That's the outcome that God gets on it. He doesn't burn up His investment. Why would He burn up you, the very person He's trying to save? Why would life consume your life? The very life that Jesus came to save. Why destroy you? Sounds like another demonic lie to misrepresent God's fire to you and keep you from truth, to keep you scared from the very thing you want. But let's not be ignorant. How is God indeed a consuming fire? What does get burned up? Because this is important. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 54. Death is swallowed up in victory. Now that sounds pretty consuming to me. Are you okay with that? Are you okay with death getting swallowed up by victory? That's pretty consuming and I like it. I like that picture. How about Romans 8, verse 2? For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made us free from the law of sin and death. Well, look at this, the law of life triumphing over the law of sin and death. Well, that sounds pretty consuming again. Are you okay with that? Do you like that? I love it. Are you good with God being a fire in your life and burning up the sin and the death so that you can walk free from the curse, enjoying the law of life and the blessings in Christ Jesus? Doesn't that sound good? Oh, I love it. One more. I got to give you just one more. Jeremiah 23, verse 29. You may have not um, heard this verse before, but listen to this. Is not my word like fire that consumes all that cannot endure the test, says the Lord, and like a hammer that breaks the most stubborn rock in pieces? Oh, my friend, this is getting exciting. God's fire consumes the junk that can't stand or endure the test. You know, you know what it is, don't you? The loneliness, the depression, the bitterness, the unforgiveness. God's fire consumes the jealousy, the envy, the lust, the sickness, the confusion, the lies, the deceit, the fear. That's a big one. The powerlessness. God's fire consumes the disorder, and that's good. So let's take our fire formula from part one and do something just a little bit different. Okay, let's be realistic about our condition before we ask Jesus into our heart. I got my little whisker again, remember? My little whisker. And um, last time we asked Jesus into our heart, but we kind of implied like our heart was empty, but you and I kind of know that's not true. Just like we talked about, a lot of times there can be something like maybe some rage, 
It can be shame. Shame's kind of common. So a lot of times we have shame in our hearts. Let's see if I can get that in there. Sometimes, oh, fear. I, I don't know anybody that doesn't need some deliverance from fear. If you don't have Jesus, got to get that fear. I won't put too much in here because <clears throat> I don't want too much of a, <laughs> a fire. Pride. Oh, that's a big one. A lot of us struggle with pride. So then we've got these toxic things in our heart. And then we ask Jesus into our heart. Remember, we invite Jesus into our heart, and it's crowded with all of our pain and our dysphoria. So what does Jesus want to do? What does He tell His disciples? He said, guys, it's profitable for you. See, Jesus was with the disciples, but He wasn't at that point in their heart. He hadn't been broken for them yet. He hadn't been pierced for them. They, they didn't know the blood of the cross yet. That blood hadn't been shed yet for them. But after His death and resurrection, see, Jesus can live on the inside, the manifest Word of God, the promises of God. But we still have, remember I had some of that shame? I had a lot of pride. Oh, I got that dysphoria going on in my life. And Jesus comes in and He fills that place in our life. And He begins to bring His promises, His overcoming promises. And I'm just going to put my little glove on here again because, you know, when Jesus gets to glowing, it can get a little hot in town. And so I take... I've got Christ in my life now. Remember, though, I still got that fear. I still got some of that pride and arrogance. I still got some toxic stuff going on in the inside of me. But Jesus wants to baptize us with the movement of the Holy Spirit, with the presence, the activation of the Holy Spirit. And so we bring Jesus the, suddenly, just like Jesus had to be activated for ministry, we bring the activation of the there it is. Look at this. We get that going. We get that fire happening. And that, oh, yeah. And I can feel the heat already. And it's starting to burn up. I don't know if you can see it, but it's starting to already burn up my shame. It's bringing my pride. Just got delivered of my pride. I just got delivered of some shame. It's burning up. It's coming out. And Jesus, I just keep activating that precious Holy Spirit, working with the Word of God in my life. And I get saved and I get delivered of all of that junk. I get delivered of all of that pain. You know, that thing is burning around 700 degrees Celsius. That, it doesn't look like, I mean, this gigantic fire, but it's hot. Like, I mean, I can feel it on my face. But man, so can my pride. My pride can't stay. My pride can't stay in that flame and that fire. And so it's a beautiful thing to have God's presence in my life, to have God's precious Holy Spirit ignite the promises of God in my life and set me free. And it's exactly what Jesus told his disciples. He says, Stephen, it's profitable for you that the comforter, the Holy Spirit, come because he will lead you. He will lead you into all truth, activating the truth. But how? Holy Spirit activates, ignites the truth, the Word of God. And that's a consuming fire, my friend. I see sickness burning up in your life right now as the precious Holy Spirit baptizes and touches the promises of God. Remember 1 Peter 2 24, by Jesus stripes you were healed. Well, how do we activate that promise in your heart? You hold the promise in your heart and then precious Holy Spirit comes along and begins moving it, begins moving the promise in your life and activate it with His electricity, with His goodness. I see chaos, confusion, and hatred being consumed out of your life, out of my life. You see, there's a fire. There's a fire ready to eliminate all the junk, the trash, the brokenness, the waste in our lives. You can invite the baptism of Jesus, which is the Holy Spirit and fire. When you welcome Jesus into your heart, you have every legal right and spiritual right to His baptism. But you've got to want it. I'm trying to stir up your appetite to want everything that Jesus has for you. Ephesians 1 verse 14 says this, The Spirit is the guarantee of our inheritance. The Spirit of God is the inheritance, is the guarantee of our inheritance. And when you fully receive His baptism with the Holy Spirit and fire, you are operating the very same way that Jesus operated on earth. Did you know Jesus had to be anointed? Jesus did no mighty works on earth until the moment He Himself was anointed with the Holy Spirit. Luke Chapter 3, verse 22 says, And the Holy Spirit descended in bodily form like a dove upon Jesus. Well, he was at 30 years of age at that point. 
Not until Jesus received the Holy Spirit activation did he begin doing ministry and, of course, destroying the works of the devil by healing people, casting out devils, curing diseases. Look, in the next chapter, we see this. In the next chapter of Luke, Luke chapter 4, verse 1. Then Jesus, being filled with the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led by the Holy Spirit. Oh my goodness, did you just see that? Then, then Jesus, being filled with the Holy Spirit, was led. You see, the baptism of fire empowers Jesus' results. Even Jesus didn't get Jesus results until he was filled with the baptism of the Holy Spirit. You know the chemistry of fire. Air plus fuel plus heat equals fire. Of course God had a timing. Look, you know, God has a timing when he wants to pull the trigger on power here on this earth. He had a timing. He could have anointed Jesus at 21. God could have anointed his son at 25. But he chose that age for the perfect manifestation of of the Word of God on earth mixed with the fuel, the movement of the precious Holy Spirit. And then suddenly, Jesus began destroying all the works of the devil. John the Baptist, he didn't even want to baptize Jesus because he felt unworthy. He knew Jesus didn't need to repent, but Jesus did need to posture himself in obedience to the Father's order to trigger the filling or the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Then there was fire. Suddenly, crowds gathered around Jesus. Suddenly, the sick were healed. Suddenly, demons ran, where before they probably didn't. Acts 10, verse 38. Listen to this. How God anointed and consecrated Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with strength and ability and power. How Jesus went about doing good and, in particular, curing all who were harassed and oppressed by the power of the devil, for God was with him. You might be thinking, well, that's Jesus. <laughs> Jesus is perfect. I'm not perfect. But you see, that's what Jesus gave us on the cross. He gave us his righteousness. The Holy Spirit is the very guarantee of that inheritance. That's Ephesians 1 verse 14. The Holy Spirit confirms our status in Christ Jesus as being the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Pray this with me and activate a miracle in your life and in your heart. Only you have the authority to welcome the Savior and the baptizer Jesus into your life. He alone is the way to God's deliverance and freedom. Pray this. Dear Lord Jesus, come into my heart. Take over my life. Forgive me of all my sins. You paid the price. You died on the cross for me. You rose up from the grave. Now baptize me with the Holy Spirit. Ignite the fire of life in me. Consume all that stuff that conflicts with your goodness. Let me be a light for you. Burning with love, joy, and peace. I'm a child of God now. In your precious name, amen. Wow. I know, I know you just recognized a shift on the inside of your heart. It's impossible to believe on the Lord Jesus and confess with your mouth and not be saved. You just inherited all the blessings of Jesus by believing in your heart and confessing it with your words. God honors your choice right now for Jesus, and He imparts life to you, forgiveness and deliverance and freedom.